having a great time with it, which is wonderful. The um, uh, reviews on Amazon have been great. Thank you for those. Thank you to everyone who's written um, five out of five reviews. Um, it's turned out to be a real page turner. It's, it's been fun to hear what people have to say about it and to hear how um, uh, everybody's enjoying it. Um, the other thing I want to start with is to remind you about the website practitioner list. We found out a few weeks ago that the website developers uh, were sent the wrong practitioner list two years ago when the new website was set up. I just don't even want to talk about it, but Kevin discovered the problem. He's been updating the list and removing, um, removing no practitioners, no, R removing the practitioners that shouldn't be there and making sure that all of your information is correct on the website. Um, please the website, check the website practitioner list and let us know if your information is correct. Uh, if we do not have your email address, we're going to be contacting you. Somebody's going to call you and um, make sure that we have your email address because that's the only way we communicate with folks these days. So those are the two new things. Um, the, uh, the resonance effect, by the way, people are buying and putting in their offices for patients to uh, sort of library out or to purchase. So that's been kind of a fun development in the last month or so. All right. So this is a woman that is 62 years old. She had a 56-year history of body pain, pelvic pain, and tightness. She's slender, healthy, happily married. Um, she was a research RN who retired 20 years ago when she was 42 because of body pain, tightness, restricted movement, and gait. Not much pain. She's pretty stoic. She rates her pain as, as a 2 out of 10, but it appears to be more bothersome than that. So a 2 out of 10 pain is not usually a big deal, but when a 2 out of 10 pain is just agitating and bothersome, that gives you a clue about where in the brain that pain exists. What, why would a 2 out of 10 be that bothersome? So that's an important question to ask. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Multiple traumas. Age 6, she was walking along the headboard of her mom's bed. She fell in it, straddling it. So the headboard struck her pubic bone and ischium, bruising and pain with urination so that you know she bruised her vulva and adhered that area. Um, the patient described this accident in detail as if it was recent, which suggests that it has an active place in the patient's amygdala, in the midbrain. Um, at the age of seven, um, she had a surgery at age seven to flip her sternum. She was born with pectus excavatum, which is a, a uh, sternum that instead of is being flat or bulging out um, has a V inward and there was there used to be a concern that that would end up compromising respiratory or cardiac function. They do not do this surgery anymore as far as I know. Um, but anyway, age seven, she had um, that surgery to flip her sternum. That left her with a scar. Um, at the age 10 or 12, she fell um, off a toboggan, split, slid down the hill on her butt, um, didn't fall off the toboggan, but just her butt's dragging on the ground. Age 13, on a teeter-totter, a person jumped off, dropped her to the ground, unable to walk for about an hour, which suggests that she had a, a spinal cord shock. Uh, she had an auto accident at age 19 where the car was totaled. Um, Around early 20s, this one's amazing, she had a boating accident where she flew out of one boat into another boat. So her boat hit something or stopped, and she was catapulted out of that boat into another boat, landed on the back of her head, we think. Um, she was unconscious for some minutes, so she had a head injury, early 20s. Age 27, she had cosmetic surgery to place, um, I think it's silicon, it's some sort of implant over the pectus excavatum scar. So she had that scar resected. She had the ditch in her um, chest modified with this plastic or 
silicon implant, um, her breast development, she's very slender, best breast development was not keeping up with the pectus implant, so they added breast implants. She's not sensitive to the silicone. They haven't leaked or ruptured, so she's been pretty lucky that way. Mid-40s, she took a yoga class, did a half lotus for 20 minutes, and had to use a walker for two weeks. That's like not normal, right? So half lotus is sort of a, a, a kind of cross your legs kind of thing, but you just cross one leg. And then she had such leg and pelvis pain that she couldn't walk for two weeks. And then she did a weights class to get in shape after. And after the third session with a leg press, something snapped in her hips and she had to use a walker for another two weeks, walked, walker, typo. Um, and her body would not move or bear weight. So she was really quite disabled from this leg press machine. That tells you something about adhesions in the dura and the nerves. If you think about the movement that's required when you do this leg press, right? You get into like a squat and then press and what what's moving? What's the things that would restrict movement or stop your body from moving the muscles would be nerves and the dura and the spinal cord. Her primary complaint is um, pain and tightness with the occiput, especially on the right, um, precipitating migraines. So she has complaint of my, chronic migraines as well. They've been better lately, but um, she'll get this tightness at the base of her skull giving her a headache um, that'll last one or two days and um, then precipitating a migraine. She has pelvic and low back tightness and pain, shoulder tightness and forward posture, and limited shoulder range of motion that she relates all to this um, thoracic tightness. Um, so pretty much she's got tightness and pain from the occiput in her neck, the pelvis, low back, and her thoracics and shoulders. So there's kind of like no place except her hands that uh, isn't affected. Physical exam, her patellar reflexes were really odd. She would have had probably hyperactive reflexes, possibly normal reflexes. The hard part was they were hard to evaluate because her there was no normal excursion they appeared to facilitate and cross a bit, but they were restricted in range. Her knee could not kick out because her leg muscles were so tight. Uh, seated straight leg raise uh, just stopped at, um, you know, it should go out to like, till the knee is straight, so 180 degrees. It stopped at maybe, or 90 degrees. It stopped at maybe halfway, 45. It was very strange. Um, when she laid down, uh, straight leg raise was tight at 20 degrees, and she felt it in the occiput and the pelvis, which suggests, once again, dural adhesions. So um, you're linking the physical exam to the history. Um, trunk flexion, so when she was seated before she laid down and we did the straight leg raise, Trunk flexion was 15 degrees, so she flexed her trunk forward at the kind of mid thoracic, and she went maybe 15 degrees into flexion, and she had pain in her tailbone and her occiput worse on the right than the left. So the um, physical exam was not normal. So even though her pain was only a two, the physical exam matches her injury history with restrictions and adhesions in places where you would expect them. Um, now this is a 56 year history of trauma and increasing restriction and range of motion. Lumbar paraspinal muscles, the abdominal obliques, the psoas were very tight and tender, so that's like really, really tender and tight. Um, neck pain, so like a plus three out of four, um, tender. Neck pain and and pelvic pain are, are more tight. Um, she rated them as a 2 out of 10, but they were bothersome. It bothered her like a 7 or an 8 out of 10. 
it as it's as if the pain frightens her or is threatening to her. And we'll we'll talk about when we get to the treatment, we'll talk about how you deal with that, but the clue going into it is this surgery that she had, injury at six and surgery at age seven, when children have surgery at an early age, it has the same effect on the amygdala and thalamus as if they had been molested or abused at that age. It's, she was in a very supportive family, so it wasn't family abuse. But the surgery counts as a centralizing um, sensitizing pain generator. It changes the way the thalamus and the amygdala deal with pain forever. Okay? So um, pain is only threatening, or pain is threatening when the amygdala and the thalamus have, when the amygdala decides it's life threatening, and when you're seven and they anesthetize you, um, that's life threatening. And then the thalamus responds by being sensitized and by making the pain of interpreting pain as a life-threatening situation. So that's why somebody could report their pain as a two, but be absolutely desperate to get rid of it. So she was um, here for two weeks. We did daily treatment for five days, and then she had five days the next, actually four days the next week. She had physical therapy, started on day three, and she had it every other day. She was apprehensive about PT and exercise, once again, because of the walker story and the exercise injury and the sensitization. So basically I saw her every day for two to three hours the first week. Um, in a normal practice that didn't have two to three hours and an out-of-town patient, this would have been not a two-week process. It would have been a six-month process, a little bit at a time, much slower, much more gradual recovery. Um, it says a lot that this patient was healthy enough and had done enough functional medicine work. She'd done a lot of nutritional stuff. She was on an allergy elimination diet. She was on anti-inflammatories. She'd done all of this to get her body ready to recover so she could produce or accommodate to these kind of changes in pain um, and function in a, in a two-week period. So, um, like I said, this, this treatment was five days a week for two weeks. In real practice, I would have done it twice a week for six to 12 weeks, and then once a week for another couple of months. So it would have been much more gradual, but the process and the thought process is the important part. So <clears throat> when somebody can't bend forward, um, it's the dura and the spinal cord. When they can't flex past 15 degrees, when they have a positive straight leg raise at 20 degrees and they feel it in their neck and their tailbone, that's the dura. What's wrong with it? It's scarred. Okay, you have a frequency for that. Scarring in the dura, scarring in the spinal cord. Okay, we set up one, so that was one machine neck to feet. Um, I had a second machine neck to feet that ran 40 and 89 for I think about an hour and then 20 and 89. So she had two or three machines on her, um, two of them running from neck to feet, one of them running back to front. Um, cord pain and pathway amplification. Um, that was 40 and 10. So you deal with the adhesions first so that when she could move, it wouldn't hurt. Deal with the anxiety about the pain with 40 and 89 and 20 and 89, 89 membrane. Then deal with the pain pathway amplification with 40 and 10. She had uh, auto care going back to front running the concussion protocol. And why did she have so many <clears throat> injuries and accidents? Remember the, the protocol called Tendency to Have Chronic Pain, TTH? Um, so we ran that back to front. Chest from the surgery and the implant, we did these last month, but I'll just run over them quickly. Scarring in the nerve, 396, the fascia, connective tissue, periosteum at the sternum, 
<coughs> and the ribs, and then the blood supply. Then the ribs were still, the intercostal space was still really tender, and so I ran torn and broken in the connective tissue. There's no tendons down there, but if you look at where the muscles attach to the periosteum, um, the connective tissue and the, and the periosteum, uh, torn and broken, took that tenderness down. She was concerned about toxicity from the silicon. And since patients will often tell you what's wrong with them, I ran 57, 920, mostly I think in the fascia, but might have, I think it was the fascia. Periosteum I tried, it didn't do much, mostly it was just um, uh, toxicity in the fascia that took that pain down. Keep in mind that these are, these are two and three hours a day for five days. Lumbar spine muscles were too tight and too tender to make sense. It's like her, her QLs were just ridiculous. Just like, no, it, no, just it didn't make any sense. Could barely touch them. They were incredibly tight. The only thing that does that is the ureter. Uh, so I tried scarring in the ureter, and that relaxed the lumbar spine muscles, increased the... Um, uh, range of motion in the low back, and then sclerosis in the adipose around the kidney. Scarring in the kidney didn't do much, but the adipose, the fat pad around the kidney, sclerosis in the fat pad, 3 and 97, that helped. So this took maybe 20, 30 minutes. She didn't have any kidney infections or any kidney stones, which you would usually think of as causing this kind of ureter thing. But the spine trauma from the falls and this thing in the boat, nobody knows how she landed except she was on her back. So you could bruise the kidney, bruise the fat pad, and bleed down and cause adhesions in the ureter. <clears throat> Mind you, she's really stoic, and she's going to keep going. She's a go-getter. And so she would not have noticed these symptoms. She would have kept going all the way through them so um, until it just she couldn't move anymore. So that was the solution for the lumbar spine muscles. Then the pelvis from the fall onto the headboard when she was six, the fall on the toboggan and the teeter-totter injury, that one, scarring in the nerve, makes sense. So that the clue for that was when she couldn't um, do the, do the uh, half lotus, scarring in the nerve, scarring in the periosteum, her ischial tuberosities and and the pelvis were very tender at the periosteum, scarring in the fascia, and scarring in the dura, all with very gentle movements. So rocking her legs, bending her knees, um, palpating her, her pelvic area and the ischial tuberosities, inflammation in the bursa, her trochanteric bursa, and if you look at the diagrams for the ischial tuberosities, there's bursa all along the tenderness attachments to the pelvis. The ischial tuberosities in the whole pelvic structure are just covered with tendons. And the, Dr. Musnick was showing me the diagrams of all the bursas. And so 40 and 195, inflammation of the bursa, just took down the pain uh, along the bony structures and the tendons. Then if you think about the fact that she fell and bruised her pelvis, 284 and 783, and then what's interesting, after that, she was still tender, but it was down on the tendons. Well, they weren't inflamed because 40 and 191 didn't do anything. What's wrong with them? What if they got just partial thickness tears? That's fair. So I tried 124, torn and broken in the tendon, and that resolved the tendon pain. Interesting. Chest and shoulder muscles were tight. So there was one unit that went from her neck to her chest, um, so one of the neck to feet units was shifted to neck to chest. We're still running 40 and 89 and 40 and 10 neck to feet neck to, on, on one machine. Then neck to chest took the second precision micro and ran it from her neck to her chest and the subscap to a supine inflammation in the nerve and scarring in the nerve and released the subscap, the serratus, the pex, the lat latch protection lapse from the serratus and the substat. 
um, she was incredibly sensitive to the tightness and it frightened her. So 40 and 92 and 40 and 89, incredibly sensitive. So the tenderness was a problem for her. And how do you tone down the sensory cortex? Why is it so jacked up? Well, could have been from the early childhood trauma. So I did 40 and 92, and that took down the hypersensitivity. 92 is the sensory cortex. 40 and 89 is the thalamus. So the symptoms that make treating this is easy. The only thing that is tricky is thinking about the fact that you have a tool that allows you to, to, to treat it, that allows you to treat it. So 40 and 89 takes down the sensitization. 40 in the sensory cortex takes down the sensitivity. And then moving her hip and pelvis passively, much less actively, she didn't know how to do that. So after we released the adhesions between the nerve and the fascia, then we could move this thing, but she couldn't activate it. So we did 81 and 84, increased secretions in the cerebellum with eccentric hip flexion, abduction, and external rotation. So got her to do slightly resisted and eccentric hip um, flexion, abduction, external rotation, and that normalized her ability to activate the hip muscles and to stop being afraid of them. So 40 and 89 and 40 and 92 took care of the sensitivity and the fear. 81 and 84 increased secretions in the cerebellum um, got her muscles reconnected with the cerebellum, okay? So then we went to her neck. I think the next visit, she had tight suboccipitals um, that created, so she had tight suboccipitals that created migraine. Her scalp was tender to touch. Contacts we put at her neck and her chest. So around 40 and 94 to loosen the upper trap. Uh, ran the concussion protocol on the unit that was back to front across her abdomen, ran 40 and 10 and 40 and 396, neck to chest, right? And then 124 and 100 at the suboccipitals because she had that suboccipital really tight um, rectus capitis posterior minor uh, issue. Um, and um, then we did inflammation in the cartilage. Who's that? Oh, inflammation in the cartilage and the disc annulus. That was my front doorbell. We do these in my dining room right next to the front door. Um, inflammation in the cartilage and inflammation in the disc annulus um, that softened the rest of the neck muscles. Her suboccipitals were tight, associated with migraine. Scalp was tender to touch. This was interesting. Um, 13 and 443, the dura, the nerve, and the connective tissue, sclerosis in the adipose, and the nerve, um, the fat, the fat lines the fascia. I remember this from my cadaver, and it was kind of like bubble wrap. So we started calling this adipose lining the fascia that's adhered to the nerve, we call it bubble wrap. So if you think of sclerosis in the adipose as releasing, you know, popping little bubbles in bubble wrap, that's a good way to think about it. Torn and broken in the ligaments, up at the suboccipitals again. Then I moved the contact from her chest up to the top of her head and did scarring in the nerve, scarring in the blood supply, up the length of the occipital nerves, up the back of her skull, 13 and 77, and 13 and 189. If you look on the advanced list, that's the frequency for the scalp. 783 is the periosteum, because her bone, like the skull, was sore and tender. Makes you wonder what, how she landed when she came off that boat and landed on the other boat. If you look at the diagram on the advanced slides, you'll see, or in the brain book, or even in Netter, I think, the blood supply, the nerves, um, and the periosteum between the scalp and the skull. Sclerosis in the adipose again, bubble wrap between the scalp and the skull. <coughs> so um, then it's like it still stayed sore. It got kind of 
annoying actually, torn and broken, bruising. And nothing else worked. So deep old bruise in the scalp, and um, that's from that landing, I guess, and the blood supply and the connective tissue. And then her occiput, this is a chiropractor thing. For the MDs in the audience, um, it, there's no way to explain it. Physical therapists will get it, and the craniosacral people will get it. 187, uh, 284 is the frequency for C1, but 187 is the um, uh, occiput C1 joint. 39 is the frequency for subluxation. Her C1 was lateral and rotated, like rotated a centimeter, half a centimeter. It was just like there was this hole. It was a bump on one side and a hole on the other. So subluxation at 187, the uh, COC1 joint, and C1 just sort of slid back down where it belonged. That was probably the most amazing 30 minutes, this, this top part of the slide, most amazing 30 minutes of, uh, I've done probably in years. So then she said, okay, the next visit, there's a spot on the end of my coccyx that's tender to touch. It's right here. Now, at this point, she wasn't hysterical about it anymore. It was just a piece of information. Since we're fixing everything, can we fix this thing? So the spot on the end of the coccyx, um, I usually think of, oh, it's the periosteum on the end of that little teeny piece of bone. Well, I did 40 and 124 with the periosteum and didn't do anything. So if you look at Netter, and I'm sitting there with Netter open on the table next to her, the other thing that is true about the coccyx and the tailbone is ligaments. It is bone and ligaments. There, there's some tendons connected to it, but it's mostly ligaments. So I did torn and broken in the ligaments. And that started to bring the pain down. So that was pretty amazing. Um, that ran, what, maybe 15, 20 minutes. <clears throat> when that stopped changing, if you're going to smack your coccyx on the headboard and you get a bruise, 284 and 100, that did something. But then this idea occurred to me. Remember the lady that talked about the um, my uterus hadn't recovered and the thing that finally made her pelvic floor muscles relax was the frequency to remove the fact of trauma from her uterus and that allowed all the pelvic floor muscles to relax. Well, that sort of popped into my head. It's like, well, what if the ligaments were just traumatized? So I ran 294 and 100 trauma in the ligaments, trauma in the periosteum. And the look on her face and the change in her body, she could feel that all over her pelvis and her low back. It was amazing. Totally surprising. Didn't expect it to do that, but it seemed worth a try. Inflammation in the ligaments. All of this was really profound in her tailbone and coccyx. Sore spot went away when we finally finished up when we did 284, deep old bruise, and then 124 with the blood vessels. Um, I tried treating the peri periosteum, but it didn't do anything. Okay. So now, um, she's, this was second to the last day. She still had a complaint of point tenderness in the pubic area, the ischial tuberosity area, and she, she put her fingers just kind of lateral to her vulva on her ischium and said it's sore right here. <coughs> so we put contacts with the low back and upper thigh and did scarring in the periosteum, the fascia, the nerve, minimal change. Inflammation in the periosteum, minimal change. 284 in the periosteum was actually pretty good. That was nifty. But then 294, remove the fact of trauma from the periosteum 783 and the cartilage at the, at the pubic synthesis, and I think actually 195. So you can add 195 to that um, 157. Okay, so last visit, second to the last visit, um, we had the contacts in her thoracic spine and her chest to finish up with that. Scarring in the nerve, scarring the connective tissue, scarring the periosteum, and she'd had it for 56 years. 
or actually, that, yeah, 56 years. Um, so that was reasonable that that would need retreating. But then the, the tendinous attachments at the intercostal spaces torn and responded to torn and broken in the tendons, torn and broken in the periosteum. And then her next complaint was she had trigger points in the right glute medius. So um, uh, did torn and broken in the um, uh, nerves, the blood supply, the connective tissue, the tendons, and the periosteum, and then scarring in all of those things. So it's possible for something to be strained and scarred at the same time. The process of the injury, you do enough to scar it. And sclerosis in the adipose. And then all of a sudden, things just sort of fell into place. The thoracic spine pain, that was my dog shaking his head from getting petted. Um, the thoracic spine pain was lateral to the spine on the right-hand side. The glute medius trigger points were just off the midline. Basically, all of the pain she described, and and yeah, all of the pain she described in this treatment session followed the bladder meridian. I've got this book by um, McMahon. Of, it's a great trigger point chart, really easy for non-acupuncturists to follow. And all of it, her fingers traced the bladder meridian. Okay, so if you land on your crotch at a tender age, you're going to crash the bladder meridian and really traumatize it. So I did trauma to the bladder. So the meridians uh, um, respond to the frequency for the organ associated with that meridian. So trauma to the bladder, reboot the bladder meridian, and 970 in the bladder meridian. And that was it. And at the end of the session, she was pain-free with full range of motion. Final visit, uh, a hot spot in the middle of the glute from a fall on a chair that was seven years ago, um, scarring in the nerve. And then it's like where she complained of the butt pain was actually more related to her SI joint. So I did, 284 from deep old bruise in her butt. 783 the periosteum and 100 the ligaments. And then if it's your SI joint, you have to consider torn and broken in the connective tissue and the ligaments. Um, the second machine was neck and shoulder, torn and broken, and inflammation. It, torn and broken and inflammation in the tendon, the connective tissue, the ligaments, and the periosteum. Um, so that was kind of like the finishing touch, just sort of brushing things up. Outcome at the end of this, 56 years of pain, no pain at the end, pain-free, not even a two, nothing bothered her, completely loose and free, nothing was tight. I did adjust with an activator, her, her pubic bone on her SI joints, um, maybe one rib. Um, so that's kind of a chiropractor thing. But, and that was... This was two months ago. She is still pain-free, still able to move, still happy. Um, objective measures, flexion started out 30 out of 60, ended up going from 30 to 52. Extension was 50, went from 50 to 64. Left and right lateral flexion, uh, were, left was 32, and right was 26 out of 40. Um, they went both even went to 38 out of 40. Left rotation went from 80 to 85. Right rotation went from 70 to 80. So her range of motion improved. She had full trunk flexion, uh, trunk on her chest. Straight leg raise was 80 degrees. She was still a little bit stiff in her hamstrings, but um, reflexes were normal. Her physical exam was completely normal at the end, and she was moving and dancing and happy and not scared and no pain. It was quite an extraordinary thing, but the, the sequence I want you to think about are the history and the trauma, the symptoms, and how to address them, how to get her to be not afraid of her body, how to release the adhesions. When is pain not from the adhesions? Maybe sometimes it's from being torn and broken. If you have a chance, go back over the slides. I can send them to you, or Kevin can send them to you. Um, 
and it just takes time to plunk through them. This next case, we only have about 15, 20 minutes to do it. Um, and this is <clears throat> um, the longest part of this is the history. So this lady came in with six pages, more or less single spaced, um, of a medical history, five pages, medical history that went back to when she was a child. Um, she's 38 years old, basically healthy. Uh, ages six to 10, she had frequent upset stomachs. Age 10, vomited every day before school. I'm gonna go through the history telling you ahead of time what it makes me think of so you know kind of where my head's going as we go through it. Age six to 10, frequent upset stomach. This is either emotional, psychological stuff, or it's gluten. The only people that have that kind of digestive issues at that early in age end up being gluten sensitive. Age 10, she vomited every day before school. That's usually uh, emotional, but can also be gluten. If they're feeding her you know, toast and eggs for breakfast, that could do that. So that's where my head goes with this. So this was the, this was the kicker, 1995, she's 16 years old. She get in March of 95, she has abdominal pain and a fever. She goes to the emergency room. Because they could not palpate a hard appendix, they didn't do a CT scan, they didn't do any imaging, they diagnosed her with a, a gastrointestinal virus and sent her home. September of that year, she went to a gastrointestinal doctor. He said, oh, change your diet, take these meds, probably Prolisec. And um, meanwhile, um, uh, she's got more and more symptoms. The short version, which they didn't find out for another two years, so 1997 at the age of 18, February of 97, they discovered that this problem at the age of 16 was a ruptured appendix and the emergency room simply missed it. I'm not even gonna go into that, so we're just gonna move onward. Um, anybody can make a mistake, I guess, but they missed an appendix and it ruptured and now she, February of 90, uh, 97, she has sudden onset of severe abdominal pain. The fluid, the imaging shows fluid in the pelvic cavity. So they go in not knowing what they're gonna find and what they find are adhesions and the remains of the appendix um, that were up, just massive adhesions in um, her um, up around her liver. So, uh, great, let's see. What was left? Catacombed in adhesions tucked up and under behind the liver. Clean out the adhesions and moved the remainder of the appendix. Um, put her on, I guess, antibiotics. But then a month, two weeks later after the surgery, he did a second surgery to remove a grapefruit size free floating abscess in the abdomen with lots of drainage put in two drainage tubes, lots of IV antibiotics for eight days, um, um, talk about the microbiome. And then uh, two months later, they ended up putting in another drain and draining off additional fluid from the abdomen. Um, October of 97, so this is all 1997 at the age of 18, intense abdominal pain, unable to move her limbs and unable to walk. Um, so she um, went to the <coughs> gastroenterologist at St. Joseph's in Phoenix, and he recommended a full hysterectomy, removing parts of the bowel and hospitalization until further answers were found. Apparently her parents were still in Utah or Idaho, and she didn't have any advice and was not feel comfortable about that course of action. So her aunt found her at her apartment, took her home with her, and took her to see an Indian, Indian medicine doctor who was a friend who nursed her back to health through nutri nutritional and, and herbs. So in 98, she started having flashbacks to child sexual abuse, um, saw a therapist for three years. 1998, she's now married, I think. Um, had a ruptured ovarian cyst, went to the emergency room. 2000, she managed to get pregnant and deliver a child. She had to be induced, but she healthy baby girl. Um, 2001, 2002, she had miscarriage. 
2003, new house. Um, uh, they removed, uh, they had to repaint it. They ripped up the carpet and repainted the house. And within seven days, she had intense abdominal pain. And here's the key, lost mobility in the legs. She was very weak. Okay, so she manages, she's still mobile, she's still walking around, except for back here, unable to walk in 97. She gets back her ability to walk. But then in 93, when they're messing with the new house, um, she uh, is unable to walk again. And that makes me think of black mold. Black mold is a neurotoxin. There is nothing about ripping up carpet and painting an older house so it's a new house for them, but it's an older house. <clears throat> Nothing about ripping up carpet and, and rehabbing a house that would make you lose mobility unless you are sensitive to the neurotoxin that is in black mold. So this put this in the back of my head. 2004, she delivered her second child and uh, ended up once again with severe pain. Uh, went to Mayo Clinic. They did all kind of... Um, testing, and um, she was walking a few steps. She could move with a wheelchair. <clears throat> um, the neuro nervous system symptoms were quite intense. Weight loss, wheelchair, they did lots of stuff. Finally, October of 2004, went to Mayo Clinic, and the possible diagnosis was, uh, oh yeah, this is that's the other thing. She managed to have a, a second child in January of 2004 while still being this disabled and this much in pain. Went to the Mayo Clinic, uh, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, conversion reaction, so hysterical conversion, lupus or Crohn's were the potential diagnosis. Um, she saw a therapist. <coughs> um, and to manage the stress of the illness on the marriage, her family, and her, she saw Dr. Brimhall, a chiropractor, in 2005. <coughs> he got her pain down. Uh, she was walking and driving. Um, 2006, she was pregnant again. And once again, the pain went back up. She was not able to walk or move. She was on bed rest. Uh, had to be helped with even the basic uh, functions of uh, life. Um, she had C-section two weeks early. Baby girl was... Um, healthy. She had tubal ligation and she was still uh, in pain and not able to move. 2007, she continued to work with Dr. Brimhall, regular checkups, got stronger and gained mobility and movement, able to manage the pain, <coughs> started being able to walk. Um, pain was like down to a two or three. That was pretty cool. 2008, Moved to Arizona. She was stable and mobile. 2009, she started having daily migraines. Um, they were still thinking this, is, this lady's got to be crazy. So she had a complete psych eval, uh, no conversion reaction. But what they did find out was that the ultrasound or the scans of her eyes and a, and a spinal tap showed that she had high pressure in the brain. Um, they can't do anything about that. But that was causing her quote-unquote migraines. So someplace in here, there had to have been something that caused adhesions in the outflow of CSF from the, from the brain. Um, there are two things that regulate CSF, spinal, cerebral spinal fluid pressure. That is the creation of the fluid in the ventricles and the outflow of the fluid out of the skull into the spinal uh, dural system. And one of the ways you can get an increase in fluid pressure in the brain is to get basically hair in the drain, to get fibrosis at the dura where it exits the skull, okay? So that's, that's going to determine part of the treatment you're gonna see in a few slides. 2010, she's diagnosed with low thyroid and was, diagnosed, was given Synthroid. Now, People that develop um, Hashimoto's thyroid and have antibodies to thyroid that, that make them hypothyroid uh, or who have difficulty with thyroid often have 
once again, gluten sensitivity, because it activates the immune system and creates um, <clears throat> inflammation in the thyroid. So this thyroid thing makes me think about gluten yet once again. Um, 2011, okay, she had more counseling, she's walking, her pain level is manageable, um, uh, colonoscopy was, I mean, things just moving along 2012. Uh, 2011. 2012, um, she moved in July into a home in Bountiful, uh, Utah for her husband's work, and there it is. Moved into a new home with severe mold and water damage. Um, they had it remediated or repaired, <clears throat> but it was followed by a severe attack of tremendous pain and this problem with mobility again. She couldn't move her arms and legs, she can't, couldn't walk. 2013, the mobility improved, so you had the house remediated. Meanwhile, nobody's talking to her about treating for mold. Um, proven mobility or pain was a five. 2014, January, July, her mobility was good, pain down was one to a two. Um, 2000, by August of 17, I don't know what happened in August of 17, um, but something happened in August of, sorry, 14, because, um, all the symptoms came back. Legs were painful to touch. She's in a wheelchair, bed bound. Prednisone helped, it says it's inflammatory, but she had severe abdominal pain. Her legs were painful to touch. Red dots in the trunk and the arms and legs, which make me think about Lyme disease, right? So you have a gluten sensitive, mold ill patient who maybe in 2014 gets bit by something, a flea or a tick or something. She gets Lyme disease. That's my working diagnosis. 2015, God bless her husband and her own determination. They go to Tijuana and see a doctor in Tijuana, Dr. Calzada in Tijuana, and he puts on IV chelation and IV antibiotics. So she's on antibiotics, chelation. They put her on an allergy elimination diet, and she is finally off gluten. And she is in mobile walking normally, no pain by November. So antibiotics, allergy elimination, and chelation. In <clears throat> 2016, as she's sitting on the couch, I think, she could feel something rip in her abdomen, ripped in adhesion. That sent up her abdominal pain. Um, 2017, ripped the adhesion again to intense pain. Radiating from the abdomen, it went to the full body. She's in a wheelchair again. Arm and leg movement are inhibited, and she's weak. So the weakness, I'm not sure if it's um, medical kind of weakness or if it's just muscle inhibition. So i got to tell you, in 22 years of seeing really sick patients, this is a, one of the most challenging histories I've ever seen. It's kind of scary. Um, but in part because of the wonderful speakers that we have, at the advanced and the wonderful people that have uh, treated me, I recognize the gluten symptoms and I recognize the mold symptoms. And we already know how to treat abdominal adhesion. So even though it's kind of a difficult history, uh, it's not completely mysterious. So these were her symptoms. Her pain level was an eight out of 10. Um, she's very stoic. Um, just that's just her heritage. That's just how she is. No exaggerated pain behavior. No moaning. No whining. She's just like, yeah, I'm an eight out of ten. You always wonder if that's correct. But I went to touch her arm, and it, she flinched like it was involuntary. Light touch on arms, legs, and the abdomen were just impossible. Salivary cortisol, she said, was below normal range. So they, she'd been diagnosed with stage four. Adrenal exhaustion. I didn't do sensory exam and I didn't do range of motion. She couldn't stand to be touched. It just didn't seem reasonable. However, she was sitting in a chair giving me her history and she said, yeah, if I sit upright, so she lays down most of the time, if I sit upright, my abdomen does this. And during the course of her history, which took about 45 minutes, her abdomen increased in girth by six centimeters. She went from like, you know, a size 10 to a size 14. It just her belly just went all. Oh. Um, we had to help her from the wheelchair to the chair and from the chair to the exam table. 
minimal trunk movement, arms and legs were movable, but any movement increased her abdominal pain. So treatment, this is the fun part. So we've got, what, two or three more slides. So I used three machines on her because I have them. I used a precision care from neck to feet because I couldn't touch her. So that's 40 and 10, right? In about, and that one stayed on from neck to feet, 40 and 10 to just reduce the sensitization, 40 minutes. And her pain was down to about a three or four out of 10 at the end of 40 minutes. <clears throat> Remember I had the suspicion about mold. If you're going to have motor inhibition, right? Where would the mold, neurologic mold have an effect? 23 and 95 with frequencies for mold. Where are they? <clears throat> 10 is the spinal cord. 94 is the medulla. All the motor pathways go through the medulla to the brain. I'm wondering if I didn't also run 84. Um, so 23 and 95 mold in the spinal cord, medulla, and um, cerebellum. And that took her pain down some more and made it easier for her to move her muscles. So these... Um, Scarring in the cord, scarring in the dura. If your brain is going to inhibit all motor function, it seems like the dura and the cord could be adhered. Also, the dura is going to be fibrosed, I think, to um, give her that elevated CSF pressure, right? So I'm scarring in the dura from neck to feet and went up and just sort of mobilized her suboccipitals. Um, so scarring in the dura helped with that. Um, as the pain came down to a three, it felt kind of weird. So the machine that was running from neck to feet, I switched to 40 and 89. So we ran 40 and 89 for about 20 minutes and then bounced back to 40 and 10. Um, suboccipitals, 124 and 100, that seemed to help. But the migraines were just scarring in the dura, scarring in the nerve. And the increased CSF pressure, obviously we don't have a remeasurement of the CSF pressure. She didn't have any headaches, so that made sense. Um, second machine was an auto carry that was on her back and her abdomen. Obviously I ran the concussion protocol. This is the first time she's been treated with FSM. And she found me because her brother is an osteopath and Amazon told him he might like the resonance effect when he bought, um, I think it was Jerry Tennant's book, and the people that bought this book also bought the resonance effect. He bought it, read it, called me. Um, she was going to be in Portland on that week. He called me Monday. She was going to be there Thursday. I didn't have patients Thursday, so I saw her basically all Thursday afternoon. Um, so I ran the concussion protocol. And then the GI bloating, okay? There, what makes what makes you bloat? Carbon dioxide, right? Gas makes you bloat. It's the only thing that's going to take your bloating up in 30 minutes is gas, okay? What produces gas in your abdomen? Well, bacteria. What are they doing that makes them produce CO2? Gas. Well, they're fermenting things, right? Well, we have a frequency for fermentative toxin, 9740. And I just had an auto care on her back and her abdomen. So I went to the GI program on the auto care, small intestine, and the auto care has a manual mode. So I went GI, small intestine, fast forwarded it till it got to fermentative toxin, 9740. Tried 9820, which is putrefactive toxin, didn't do anything. So I went back to 9740, it softened her abdomen, started to take the pain down. So I pushed the hold button on the auto care, and that frequency, 9740, ran for about 40 minutes. <clears throat> now, while that's going down and her abdomen is becoming less tender, then I can start palpating her abdomen. Well, on the right side of her belly, you can hardly touch her, from her ribs to her ilium. You could hardly touch her. Remember the history? Remember the ruptured appendix? And that were, where the infection from the ruptured appendix was behind her liver? 
right? Right upper quadrant, all in the back. So 64 and 42, 64 and 63, pus and pus encapsulated. So I ran that for 30 to 40 minutes. So these three were all in that small intestine program and they ran on the auto care while I started treating the adhesions. So the adhesion itself, 13 and 77. Scarring in the bladder. So you remember the ruptured ovarian cyst? So once the general abdominal adhesions were relaxed with 13 and 77 and the bloating and pus and pus encapsulated the problem caused by the original abscess years before, that went down. Then what's left is just straight up adhesions between the organs. Scarring in the bladder, 37, the two, the ovary, seven, the two, four, the transverse colon, 27 and 16. She so had a lot of tightness and adhesions in the upper abdomen. 35 is the liver, and that's where the uh, abscess was, so that was all um, uh, adhered. Gallbladder, bile duct, there's some frequencies I left out of here. The small intestine was just like a brick, so we treated that. 65 is the descending colon, 129 is the sigmoid. So all of those had adhesions. That was another 40 minutes. Then when I went to palpate or psoas, it was incredibly tender and tight. So scarring in the ureter, right, 13 and 60. That relaxed the psoas and eliminated her low back pain. That was extraordinary. In the small intestine, the omentum in the abdomen um, doesn't scar, it's sclerosis. So when you're finishing up with abdominal adhesions and pelvic pain, it's sclerosis in the adipose. And that takes 10, 15 minutes. So you just sort of soften that up. Now at this point, pain was a four, okay? You notice that I have not run 40 on anything in the abdomen. It's all been the spinal cord and the brain. <clears throat> so once the pain was down to a four, once 97, 40, and 64, and 42, and 64, and 63, pus and pus encapsulated, finished doing their thing, I ran 40 and 116, and she started giggling. It was hilarious. It was just like she got all warm, and her pain dropped to a two. It was fun. And then the ruptured ovarian cyst, and then all of the surgeries and the bleeding, and she's had two C-sections, around 284 and 62. At the end of it, the pain was about a two or a three, um, and it felt weird, obviously. Now, I still had a unit that was running from neck to feet, and I switched that one to 40 and 89 at the end until it just sort of stopped feeling confusing to have the pain gone. Um, we got her up treated scarring in the dura a little bit more, made sure she could flex her body and flex her hips to where the dura is attached to the sacrum. That took about 10-15 um, minutes and we got up and had her do the, you know, the drum major re gram walking where you do toe first and then heel, toe, heel. That took about 20 minutes but she finally figured out how to walk again. This is a woman that hasn't walked in well, years basically. Um, she walked to the bathroom. Her daughter pushed her wheelchair. Uh, pain levels two. Uh, she was able to go pee, and it didn't hurt. Um, we've been in touch. Uh, she is still okay. Ten, twelve days later, four out of ten. Uh, recommended that she do urine mold testing if you're not familiar with this. It's real time labs. Um, www.realtimelab.com. They will send you a kit. Um, it has to be, you have to fill out the order form. It's $699 for the first one and $299 for subsequent ones. It's your best $700 here we're going to spend. If a patient has the symptoms that make you uh, suspect um, mold. So she's coming back for treatment on July 10th and 11th, and we'll see how she's doing. So the take-home message is, number one, even scary patients can be treated. That was an intimidating, scary history. Right? But do it sensible. Fermentative toxins is not rocket science. It's like her belly's bloating, so that's 9740. She had fermentative toxin. She had a huge abscess in her abdomen for two years. So pus and pus encapsulated is kind of a sensible thing to do. So you kind of got to think. You couldn't touch her arms and legs. What is that? 
40 and 10. Um, once the pain was gone, it felt weird. What's that? 40 and 89. 97, 40 for the bloating. Abdominal pain started as a child. If she isn't gluten sensitive, I'll eat my hat. She remains off of gluten ever since she got back from Mexico. Um, so that's important. Um, migraines, 124 and 100. Scarring in the dura, subluxation in the dura. And then mold exposure. If she doesn't come back positive for stachybotrys, I'm going to have to rethink this, but I'd be really surprised if she doesn't. So that is the take-home message from this great case. The lady is wonderful. We're enthusiastic. She's still walking around, still getting stronger. Um, I want to remind you about the 2018 advanced. We're going to be at the Crown Plaza in San Marcos, Chan Crown Plaza San Marcos Golf Resort in Chandler, Arizona. March 1st, we are going to have one of the most exciting speakers you're ever going to hear on an FSM podium, I think. Jay Shaw, he doesn't talk about FSM, but he talks about the um, neurology of pain, well, neurology of pain sensitization, central sensitization, and the relationship between pain and the autonomics and the central nervous system. He um, is a physiatrist at the National Institutes of Health, and uh, he has got to have the best slides I have ever seen in my life. You could come just to watch the, the animations on the slides and just be completely entertained for six or six or so hours. At the end of it, we always, as a favor, treat his trigger points in his legs because of um, the causations. He's written some wonderful papers about myofascial trigger points. Um, I'm really excited about having him come March 1st. That's a Thursday. The advanced is going to be Friday and Saturday, March 2nd and 3rd. Um, oops, got that. Yeah, March 2nd and 3rd is the advanced course. Uh, we've got really exciting speakers this, this year. I don't have all of them nailed down, but you'll see um, um, DiMartino and um, Paris Carbot, Kim Pittis, um, and some of our really popular, um, knowledgeable speakers. Um, expert workshops have become my favorite part. And then March 4th is a practicum instructor training. As we move FSM more towards online modules and DVD modules, um, it's going to be important to have practicum instructors who can train people that take the course at a distance. And I want you to, to seriously consider joining us for that practicum instructor training. So here we are. Every patient who wants to be helped by training practitioners who can treat them promote, teach, research, and write about FSM in such a way that it thrives. And I'm seriously hopeful that the resonance effect will take FSM into the public mainstream in a way that would never have been possible without that book. Um, keep your fingers crossed. Um, give it, sell it to your patients and spread the word about what you do and where it came from and why it works and that it works. And uh, it's going to help patients and practitioners all over. So here's our motto, changing medicine one patient at a time, changing practitioner lives one practitioner at a time. That would be you. And changing even one patient's life can change the world. This lady, these two women that we treated will change their lives by what they are able to do now that they're better. Thank you for joining us.